Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today I'd like to talk about an explanation for why some atheists are atheists that I've heard, which never really made sense to me, but I've come to understand in a different way. And that explanation is that they are atheists because they want to feel smart. And um, as I said, I, I was very dubious about this when I first heard it. Uh, for several reasons. But then I came to understand it in a different way. So I'd like to talk about this different way of understanding it that's that's more plausible. And um, so I'd like to begin at the beginning, however, which I have on good authority is a very good place to start. And that is that um, one hears this explanation, you know, oh, I'm an atheist because there's no evidence for God. And this is actually kind of amusing because in a proper sense, everything is evidence for God. Everything that exists is evidence for God. Uh, now, when I say God, of course, I'm talking about um, God as understood in natural philosophy without, you know, the additional self-revelation that you get within Judaism and Christianity. Um, but just, you know, the God of the philosophers has been known, the uncaused, the uncaused cause of all that is, the unmoved mover. Um, and by the way, in unmoved mover in the sense of why it is that one moment turns into the next moment, why things change at all. It's not about, you know, origins and history, but rather about, you know, how is it that time can actually progress? Um, the the non-contingent non source of all contingency. Those things um, that you find in St. Thomas's uh, Five Ways to, to Know That God Exists. All descriptions of the same thing, all descriptions of God is understood by Christians and Jews, um, but Christians and Jews add uh, add additional information about God because God revealed things to us. But leaving that aside, talking, focusing just on that, everything that exists is evidence for God in the sense of the unmoved mover, the um, the non contingent source of contingency, and so on. Literally everything. It is actually literally the case that you cannot swing a cat without hitting evidence for God. Uh, if you're in an atmosphere, air, if you're in hard vacuum, even time-space itself is evidence for God, since time-space is changeable. Now, since everything, literally everything, that an atheist encounters is evidence for God, and yet he says that he doesn't find any evidence for God, this brings up the question of, well, why? Why is it that he doesn't see something where it's impossible to not see it? And so there are different explanations that come across. And by the way, uh, nothing that I've said is an argument for God's existence, and nor am I going to be presenting any arguments for God's existence. I'm just explaining why this is an interesting question to those of us who do see the literal, you know, the, the overwhelming evidence for God. Now, um, there are different explanations that apply in, in differing degrees. Um, in, in different cases, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting there's one explanation whenever you have a large number of people, you're going to have, you know, even one person, you'll tend to have threads. Whenever you have a large number of people, you have many, many threads that go into making it up. And, you know, for any given person, there might be, you know, three, five, seven or more things that sort of contribute to, you know, why it is that they're the way they are for whatever thing, and that includes atheism. This is one particular explanation I'd like to look at because it never made sense to me and then started to. And so I'd like to offer... Um, how it, it came to make sense and how to look at it. So the first key in this is that um, I think that it's not about, that, that saying that they want to feel smart is actually a little bit inaccurate. What's really meant by the people who offer this explanation is that they want to not feel stupid. And uh, I'm using the word stupid, by the way, um, very broadly. But consider the following. When you have one person who says something like, in order for change to happen, there needs to be some sort of, um, there needs to be something which causes the thing to change. It can't contain the next, you know, it can't, one moment can't contain the next moment in it, or it would already have it and wouldn't become it. So there's some change, something that causes it to change, and it's not from within itself, so it must be from some external source. Either that thing itself is unchangeable or it can change, and if it's changeable, then so on, you go back until you find something which is unchangeable. And then, you know, cutting this short, because this is not what it's about, um, you know, St. Thomas says, this all men call God. Well, when somebody says that, and then another person hears it, and what they hear is basically, you know, the Charlie Brown teacher, you know, wah, 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 wah,
really all they can make of it. There's a problem that arises. One of these two people must be an idiot. Either the person who thinks he's saying something sensible with English words, something, you know, rationally intelligible, who thinks he's saying that, either he is correct or incorrect. If he's correct, the other guy who, to whom this is pure nonsense is an idiot. Again, using the term idiot in broad strokes. If, however, he's actually speaking nonsense but thinks he's speaking sense, then he is an idiot. Again, idiot in broad strokes. And I'm not talking about just, you know, base mental capacity, but, but you know, the ability to think rationally gone horribly wrong to the point of, you know, being the inability to think rationally. One of these two things has to happen. There are two horns of this dilemma, and somebody is getting the sharp end of it. Um, technically, they both could be idiots, but that's kind of irrelevant to the moment. This is the problem that the person to whom this sounded like, you know, the Charlie Brown teacher has. He's got to explain somebody's stuck, you know, getting the sharp end here. Who is it? Which one of us is the idiot? Now, now, no one likes to think that he's an idiot, but, you know, it's a sort of thing that everybody's got to consider. You know, everyone, ha everyone who's honest has to think, like, well, I could be doing something wrong here. A person thinks that what they're doing, you know, what they're saying makes sense and it doesn't make sense to me. Maybe I misunderstood them. Maybe I, you know, I'm, maybe they're using words in a different sense. Maybe there's just something I'm unaware of. And we come to something interesting. Um, that's that's highly related to this. A uh, friend of mine had suggest, had mentioned, and this, this is, um, I believe, I'm going to quote a statistic, but it's it's an, you know, it's an estimation. It's not, I believe, uh, he didn't cite it as like the result of a study, just an estimation. But what he said was something like 90% of atheists have father issues, either an absent father or a very neglectful father, just, you know, really, really bad father, something along those lines. And so the problem is that um, there's a little bit of generalization that goes on, because uh, when I describe the, the role of mother and father here, occasionally mothers and fathers will swap them. It's not so... there's a commonality in who takes which role. It's less significant who takes which role than it is that there are two people who each take these roles in the raising of a child. Um, because you, you need somebody who is very understanding, who is very accepting, you know, nurturing in, in um, you know, sort of common terms, who you know, isn't particularly challenging to the child because the child's someplace safe. And, oh, by the way, people can even swap these, like, like you know, depending upon the context. You also need a parent who is going to be tough with the child, who's going to, when appropriate, who's going to challenge them, who's going to show them when they're wrong, who is going to force them to admit errors, at least to themselves, because it's a critical part of growing up, is admitting your errors and therefore fixing them. Um, now, it is very commonly the case that a mother will take the nurturing, always accepting, always protecting, you know, no matter what sort of role, and the father will take more uh, of the, the disciplinarian, the, like, this is how life is, and you, you know, just deal with it. It doesn't matter whether or not you want to, just, you know, stop crying, be quiet, and do what you have to. That sort of, um, you, you know, like, it doesn't matter how you feel, you're simply wrong, be quiet until you start being right. That sort of, you know, I'm talking about the extremes of this, but that sort of role. And the thing is, they they each role takes sort of an extreme and they balance each other out. If you have only one of these, well then, you know, if you, if, just like with scales, if you take away the disciplinary and you only have the acceptance, you fail. If you take away the acceptance but you only have the discipline, you fail. In both cases, you need these two to balance each other out, which is why you need the, the two parents. Um, you know, people who, you know, people who have lost a parent, um, are often in a very bad way. And it, it's really hard, um, very, very hard on a, you know, when somebody's spouse dies and they have to be the only parent to their, to their child, trying to balance these two roles out themselves is very difficult. And, you know, God bless them and, you know, my heart goes out to them because it's, it's just a very, very difficult thing to do is it just and especially amongst fallen humanity, so much more doable when you have two people to balance this out. Well, um, as my friend said, so many people don't have that one. And so they have just the, you know, whether it's the absent father, the neglectful father, the father who's simply not there. Uh, by absent, I mean, you know, like always spends all his time away. 
what you have is this off balance where you don't have somebody taking that one role. And you also don't have somebody who's imparting a lot of, of these lessons because, um, again, one of the things about, you know, having two parents is they live different lives. And so they'll, you know, learn different lessons and emphasize different things. By having just the one in their life, they, um, and given the, the commonality of who takes which role, um, what you will often, uh, what ha will often happen is a person who will have to supply that for himself with the father not being there. And so when he's supplying that for himself, there's sort of two things that happen. There are lots and lots of effects um, and all sorts of great documentation about just how awful uh, the effects are in aggregate, you know, on average uh, for being missing a father. But um, the things that concern us here are about um, two things. One, the absence of somebody who is properly challenging, challenging in, in that sort of, you know, respectful, positive sort of way that a father is supposed to be. And then the other is the lack of an authority figure makes a person who has to start figuring these things out for himself take on the role of authority figure to himself. And this one, that second one, is especially interesting uh, in, in the present circumstance because if a person is an authority figure to himself, it can create some very, very bad relationships to other authority figures. And one of the things that a person will find, you know, when, you know, say there's a father to be that, that, that paternal authority figure, is that it's immediately obvious that that father is also himself under some other authority. You know, it's just incredibly common where, you know, um, you know, a child says, Dad, I want to play, and, and the father says, no, I'm sorry, I have to work. You know, if I don't show up to work, my boss will fire me. It, it in whatever exactly it is, you know, whether, you know, owning a business, you're still beholden to customers and so on. Um, whatever exactly the, the role, there's that subordination of the authority figure. So the person who is imposing discipline is himself under discipline. And so that teaches about the nature of hierarchies and about how you balance out having your own, um, you know, having your own dis discipline, but, you know, being under discipline yourself. And so that not being there results in a person being their own discipline. They don't have that sort of hierarchical, um, you know, that, that natural lesson in hierarchies where the authority figure himself naturally fits into a hierarchy. Um, and this, uh, this can easily cause two effects, one of which is um, a dislike of authorities. Um, this is something that, as I understand it, um, statistics tend to show that, that um, atheists tend to, in general, uh, do poorly with authorities. Uh, authority, you know, with authority. They tend to dislike authority. Um, and you can often see this play out in the first disliking organized religion and then, and then you know, sort of the next step of all religion. Um, but also, um, there's another thing about being your own authority figure, which is that when that sort of gets wrapped up into one, it becomes, admitting the possibility that you yourself are wrong um, is also admitting that your authority could be wrong. And so a lot more is at stake in any given instance of considering whether or not you yourself could be mistaken about something. Um, so you can see how this would have a direct impact, you know, into this, this situation where if you don't understand what the theist is saying, you know, supposing you're, you're the atheist or the proto-atheist, you don't understand what the theist is saying and it sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher to you, and you know that one of the two of you is an idiot. The problem is if you're the one who is being the idiot in this circumstance, now you've got a lot at stake. Not only are, you know, not only have you not really learned to do as much self-examination, um, you know, being in that, in that uh, you know, sort of fatherless circumstance, you also, now it's your authority, the person who's taught you a lot of the important lessons of your life, yourself, is also being undermined. So there's a lot that's at risk um, here in a psychological sort of sense. And so you can see why it's really important psychologically, why there's this real important psychological need to come to the conclusion that the person who is being the idiot in the circumstance is not me, it's him. And so um, this, I think, is what's meant um, by that uh, thing that people say that, that atheists are that many atheists are atheists because they want to feel smart, more accurately because they don't want to feel stupid. That is to say that in this dilemma, they have a deep need to not be the one who is in significant error here. 
Um, and so, you know, more properly, it's they don't want to feel stupid. And so it's not that, that for them being an atheist makes them feel smart, that is to say above average. It's just that it makes them feel normal, like there isn't something significantly wrong with them. That, you know, which, you know, now, when I say significantly wrong, um, living in a largely non-Christian culture, I don't mean, like, they should be put to death. I mean, you know, I don't mean they're defective and therefore just pure garbage to be thrown away forever. Or, you know, anything along those lines. When I, when I say that they're, you know, highly, you know, defective or what have you, I just mean there is something wrong with them that they need to fix. Um, but, you know, fixing things that are wrong with you is hard. Uh, it can be very hard. And um, it can be scary and difficult, especially if you don't know how to do it. And doubly so if you don't have any mentors to help show you the way to fixing your errors, if you have to do it all yourself. Um, it's an especially difficult, especially scary sort of proposition. So I'm not, in the end, saying that this is definitely the case about most atheists. I'm, you know, the world's a big enough and varied enough place. It's got to be highly accurate to at least one person at some point in time. How widespread it is, I don't know. Um, but for a long time, I didn't understand what was meant. It just didn't seem to fit reality. And this seems to fit reality much, much better. And I think is what's, what's meant here. So, um... Yeah, in conclusion, I offer that up as a possible interpretation of what's meant by saying that, that uh, many atheists become atheists because they want to feel smart. Um, maybe that's what's meant. It certainly seems plausible in at least some circumstances. And until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.